Um, oh, oh, see? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, both and neither, uh, I am Uncle Kage, and I want to thank you very much for enduring the, uh, the, the, the German summer heat uh, to join us in this room and, and to sit out there in that audience while this you drunken old idiot up here uh, talks and hopefully makes you a lot happier than when you first walked in the room. That is my job. I am assisted, actually I shouldn't say assisted, I am joined up here by the actual talent, the, somebody who, who can, can make a living doing this, Mr. Foxamore. thing for me to say assisted absolutely not I still remember the very very first time we shared the stage together I don't quite remember exactly how it came about I don't know why <laughs> how did it come about no oh, alcohol apparently alcohol was involved but um, I do not feel I do not feel that I can give a satisfying performance without the musical accompaniment of this talented genius to my right. Thank you. You're kind of cool too, I guess. <laughs> Aren't you sweet? Actually, I just, any opportunity I can get to have Fox talk, I, I can give him, like, directions to a bandsaw or something, I just want to hear him read it. Because to Americans, uh, the Scottish accent is about as cool as it can be. Anybody from Scotland is automatically a pirate. Am I right? You're not on the sea, you're just clap. <laughs> Actually, I think, the, I think the, the, the actual pirate accent originated from Cornwall. Cornwall? Yeah. Isn't that like in a, Scotland? Yeah, no, no, no. No, there's like a... American education system. They do have their own tartan, though. <clears throat> so, Cornwall, so it's a Cornish accent. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, outside, uh, while folks were waiting, I, since I was pre-gaming, I kind of wanted to pre-game with all of you. So I, I started on a story that was not meant to be, be part of the stage, but since I didn't finish it, I'll, I'll start again, if it's all right. So the folks up front, you can go get a, a pretzel or a beer or something. This is Germany. Uh, <clears throat> but a number of years ago, this is what I do. I just drink and talk, and Fox plays the piano, and apparently you like it. I hope so. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was here in uh, late December for Silvester. I love spending that holiday here in Germany. Uh, it is incredible. And I was staying in a, a, little, uh, a little pension hotel uh, outside of Essen. And when I left in the morning to return to my country, the, the innkeeper gave me a present. It was, it was a big paper bag. It was very heavy. I said, what is this? He said, that's a German Christmas cake to take home to your family and share. I said, thank, thank you so much, thank you. So I took it with me. And as I told the folk outside, this joke works better on an American audience because we're stupid. It doesn't work good on an intelligent audience, so just kind of bear with me. Pretend you're Americans for a second here, all right? We can. Give me, let me hear a yee-haw. There, that works. I feel like I'm at home. Well, uh, I put this thing into my carry bag. And when I, I was flying out of Frankfurt that year, and when I got to the security, I put my bag in and I went to the metal detector, and there she was. She has been there every trip that I have ever taken from Germany. Doesn't matter the airport. Could be Berlin, it could be, uh, it could be München, it could be Frankfurt. She's always there, Helga. <laughs> Helga is apparently Prussian. She is one and a half meters tall in every direction. <laughs> she is, she's like a little sphere of anger. And she was standing back there with an expression that looked like this. And she grabbed the suitcase and she took it back and she said, Is this your bag? Yeah. She said, 
English oder Deutsch? I said, English, du mal Amerikaner. She said, I believe you're a cake which is stolen. I said, oh, no, 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 uh, gift, 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 gift. Yeah, yeah, don't say that in Germany either, I found out. <laughs> I thought they had security footage of somebody making off with this cake out of a store, and they thought it was me. And I said, no, no, I, I didn't, uh, no, that's, that's not the case. Come, she put the bag on her arm. I spy, I spy, I spy, I spy. We went through that door. That door. You know the one at the airport, the one that has no writing on it? Inside was a small room made entirely of cinder block walls. And there was a very, very tired, put upon man sitting at a desk like this. He kind of looked like Cheetah. <laughs> who suffers very, very, very long and hard so that you guys can have a good time. I want to have a word, and a big, big shout out to my choreographer. But this was basically Cheetah Light. He's back there like this. He didn't even open his eyes. He said, put, put your bag down, please. And Helga held the bag out to me with a look in her face that said, Don't try anything. I put the bag down. She to light said, uh, Please open. I opened the bag and Helga said, Ja, stolen! I learned a new German word. Nobody told me what a stolen is. It's a fruitcake. So that's my new German word. I learned that the, the word for fruitcake in German is stolen. <laughs> Cheetah Light finally opened his eyes. He sighed <sighs> wearily. He took a cotton swab and he started to examine the entire surface of the stolen. And then he put it into the chromatograph and then he went back to convention chairman mode. <laughs> Helga was watching me the entire time, waiting, waiting for the opportunity to, I, I don't know, break my spine, <laughs> yell at me. I would prefer she broke my spine. She was scary. And finally, the little machine went ding, and he said, yeah, it's okay, you, you can go. So I zipped the bag up, and Helga kept looking at me suspiciously. I was curious, and as I sit the bag up, I said, excuse me, I, I don't understand. Did I do something wrong? Is, is it not allowed to, to bring this? And he sighed again, sadly. He said, the trouble is the stolen cake has the same signature in x-ray as C4 explosive. <laughs> I said, so Helga here thought that I had five kilograms of C4 with walnuts and raisins and marzipan dusted with powdered sugar. He said, yeah. She just likes that. I said, well, they told me this is tradition for this holiday. Does this happen a lot? He said, yeah, just this morning, you're number five. <laughs> so we went back out. I had my bag and Helga was walking next to me. I spy, I spy, I spy, I spy. <laughs> and I said, Helga, I should, I should mention, uh, just, I thought this was funny. I didn't laugh because you're very terrifying. But you see, when you said stolen, that means something else in English. And I thought that I was being accused of a crime and she stopped and she thought about it. And for about a microsecond, she started to smile. And when she did, her entire face just shattered and fell off of her skull. 
that's not true. That is the only part of the story that isn't true. She actually thought it was funny. And I suspect that because of that, every single American tourist that came through the rest of that day, Helga said, I believe you're a cake which is stolen! Because that's how she gets her jollies. <laughs> Is anybody here by any chance from the Dominion of Canada? Ah, we have some Canucks here. Hello! That's America's hat. We love you guys. I was uh, cut off from my Canadian friends, who are like family to me, for quite some time due to the, uh, the COVID restrictions. And when the border finally opened between uh, Canada and the United States, I had an opportunity to go and visit. In fact, they were, for the first time, reopening Fernal Equinox, the Toronto Convention. Fernal Equinox has the, I don't want to use the word distinction, uh, what's the opposite of distinction? Uh, it has the misdinction, the stinction. Yeah, oh, misfortune, yes. I like distinction, it has the stinction of being the first convention that had to cancel because of the COVID lockdown, one week before the convention. Yes. <laughs> well, I hate, as much as I hate to say it, all of the other conventions learn from the example that Fernal Equinox set. They set the pace for all of us who had to cancel. They taught us what to do. They showed us the way and blessed them for that. Um, I do feel bad for their suffering. But when Fernal Equinox finally reopened, I very much wanted to support the convention, so I wanted to go. I arrived at Pearson Airport, which is not so much an airport as it is a combination between a prison and a nightclub. <laughs> if you understand what I mean. We have COVID restrictions, right? We, we, have, we have our masks on masks on our faces, and they sent us into the uh, arrival area where we're standing like this with people we don't know, and there was not enough room to socially distance, and I saw something, okay, I'm very old-fashioned, I, I go back to a different era, um, and please forgive me if what I say might be considered politically incorrect these days, but... Where I come from, you do not hit a woman. But boy, did I want to. I came as close as ever to just out of the blue physically assaulting another person. Because this lady was standing two people in front of me. The pandemic was still going on. We were taking precautions as we could. And in the line ahead of me, I watched her do this. Now, I just stood there completely aghast and the physical thought, the physical thought in my head was none of these people would be witnesses. They would all say they didn't see me cold cock her in the nose. But I didn't because she'd probably bleed on me and that's also a vector. You don't want that. I remember that, that trip to Fernal Equinox because when I got up to the, uh, to the border, it, this is always a little bit of a, uh, a, an awkward thing when you get to an international border because I always dress in business attire when I travel. It's what I do because there was a time that's what you did. Traveling used to be classy and I remember that. So I got to the agent, little French-Canadian guy, with one of his little mustaches, and he said, uh, your passport, what is, the, what is the purpose of your stay here in Canada? And I said, well, I'm going to a conference. Usually that's all I have to say. 
Scientist, business attire, and going to a conference, right, fuck off, there I am, gone. And he looked at me for a few seconds and he said, what kind of conference? I said, well, oddly enough, uh, it, it's a cartoon conference, it's a hobby of mine. And he said, I see. What is your role at this conference? I said, okay. He wants to play. <laughs> what is my role at this conference? Well, you see, I'm a really big fan. I'm kind of like what they call a super fan. I've got 250,000 Instagram subscribers because I know most of the voice actors are going to be there. For example, I got Ben Diskin on speed dial on my phone. And then I mention I got 250,000 subscribers on my, my Instagram. I'm going to go there. You might kind of say it like I'm an influencer because super fans can really be influencers. And I'm going to go there. And, and he just said, So, thank you, just go. I said, in fact, in fact, I, I got a message. I got a message from, from Charlie Adler. Do you know who Charlie Adler is? Charlie Adler was the voice, but he was, he was the voice of, uh, of Buster Bunny in Tiny Toons. And I, I got a message from him. Let me show it to you. He said, go, sir, just please, please go. And I said, oh, you, oh, you gotta see this. I mean, and the fact he follows me, he follows me on Instagram. I got Charlie Adler as a follower on Instagram. Did I mention, he's one of the 250,000 followers I got. That's, that's kind of what happens. That's why they call you an influencer, because we've got 250,000 followers on Instagram, and especially Charlie Adler. I want to get Ben Diskin, I hope I get him. And he's saying, sir, please, leave, go, please, don't stop talking and go away, please. You want to fuck with me, Frenchie? Okay. Don't fuck with Uncle Kagi, you won't win. <laughs> I know another guy who learned that lesson. <laughs> and of all places, Pittsburgh. I own that city. <laughs> we have been gone for, on the calendar, three years. However, I want everybody to understand that by international agreement, 2019 is referred to as last year. You all got that. When we talk about last year, that was 2019. Got it? Okay, we're all there. But a lot can happen in one year. There is a little restaurant in Pittsburgh. It had been one of my favorites because they had very good wine there. I, I have sake tonight, but my absolute favorite in the world is German Riesling. Riesling aus Moseland. Absolutely the best in the world. And uh, that's what I was hoping to get. I went in with two Anthrocon's directors, and we sat at the bar, and this little girl about nine years old, when you're my age, they all look that age, she was nine years old. She came in, put her school books down, climbed on top of them because she couldn't reach the bar, put down her homework and said, yes, what can I get for you, gentlemen? <laughs> and I said, okay, Riesling, Riesling, okay, just, just bring us a bottle of Riesling, please. So she brought three glasses, she brought a bottle, she put up the stone, the, the cold chiller, put the bottle in, she poured for us and put this in the stone and she walked away. And I took my glass. Here is to Pittsburgh, and this thing's not working again. There it goes. Did I drop it? No. I took that sip, and I said, "Wait a minute." I said, "Guys." think this is Riesling. And I pulled the bottle out and it said, maybe it was a typo, it said Gewurztraminer. <laughs> I said, oh, that's, that's not what I wanted. Now, I don't mind Gewurztraminer. It's a, it is a good wine, but I wanted Riesling. Do you, do you know how when you want to bite into a cookie and you think it's chocolate chip, but you bite into it and you realize it's a raisin cookie? It, it's an okay cookie, but that's not what you wanted. 
So when, when the little schoolgirl came back, I said, excuse me, miss, this, this is not Riesling. And she said, confidently, yes, it is. I said, oh, no, no, I, I, I can assure you it's not. She said, no, of course that's Riesling. Miss, this, this is not Riesling. And she looked at me a little impatiently and she said, Sir, that is Riesling. Now, it's very popular in my, in my country right now for people to gaslight each other and make them doubt reality. Don't do that to me when alcohol is involved. You're going to get hurt. And I said, Miss, this is Gewurztraminer. She looked at me patiently and said, Gewurztraminer is the same as Riesling. I actually had to look at the fellows. Excuse me, let me Google this. Oh, really? Oh, okay. The, the guy who, who invented the Muller Torgel grape was from Switzerland. You know how it is when you get to Wikipedia. <laughs> and I got back on track. Oh, wait, shit, shit. Um, I said, okay, no, Miss Gewurztraminer is not Riesling. And she said, would you like to speak to the manager? <laughs> I thought, this is interesting. It's a reverse Karen situation. <laughs> I'm curious. I, I very, yes, I, I'd like to speak to the manager. Thank you for the, the offer. So she went toddling off. And what appeared next to me was a gentleman. And I could tell even before he started talking that he was French. And I mean that because he had on a striped shirt, a beret, a baguette under his arm. <laughs> Seriously. He was as French as they come. And he said, in that gorgeous, melodic French accent that I adore so well, he said, eh, my apologies, uh, the, the bartender is not well versed in wine. Of course, Gewurztraminer is not the same as Riesling. Uh, could I interest you perhaps in a Pinot? Uh, well, that's very kind of you, but no, I wanted some Riesling. And he said, eh, we, uh, we, we, we have no, no listening. Uh, perhaps you would like to have a Chablis. He's getting further away. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this gentleman obviously knows something about wine. I'll explain. And I said, well, okay, please, please understand that, that I, I actually had something very specific when I came in here. Um, I do prefer for the white wines, the German varietals, because they have a higher residual sugar, even the dry wines tend to be sweeter. And that, and that is when I knew I was in trouble because I had forgotten who I was talking to. The very second I said German, his face just crumpled up like a ball of aluminum foil. And he said, Yes, of course, uh, they do have the higher residual sugar, and he started to walk away. And do, and do, and do. <laughs> so I said to the fellows I was with, let's, let, let's just pay for the bottle, finish this, and get out of here. <laughs> um, and we did. And I found out later from one of the fellows I was, I pride myself on being an observant person. I normally see things, but this I missed. What I did not recognize at the time, I was gonna say what I did not see, I don't wanna say that here. What I did not recognize at the time was Frenchie had gone to the corner of the bar and sat there staring at me just like Helga. <laughs> So, I did not go back. I didn't go back during Anthrocon this year. Which is a shame, because that's where we used to have our annual board of directors dinner with our guests of honor. 
which is one of the major expenses in our catering budget. <laughs> but apparently, Frenchie wasn't interested. I told this story to some of the representatives of the Pittsburgh Tourism Bureau, and they whispered to each other, and one of them said, would you like us to have a word with that French gentleman? And I said, oh, yes. <laughs> I'm still waiting to hear back. <laughs> One of the things that came out of this whole COVID nonsense personally for me, other than a case of COVID, which was no fun, <clears throat> is that when you're a storyteller, you sort of rely on experiences that you can then share with others. In that one year period since last year, remember, not a lot really was able to happen to me. On one hand, that's bad from a storytelling perspective. On the other hand, that's good from a life perspective because I've always told people I like getting new stories, but I don't like the getting of the stories, if you understand where I'm coming from. I used to work, so what I'll have to do is recycle some ancient stories from years and years in the faint past. I shall dredge them up from my memory and hope that I can get them as accurate as I can. Because memory fades with age. And that's what sucks about YouTube, because if I get one of these facts wrong, one of you people's going to give me shit for it. I just know. But I used to have a, uh, an interesting job. Um, I was still living in the state of Pennsylvania at the time, uh, which is the only state in our union where you can get something close to a proper German-style soft pretzel. Only in Philadelphia can you get a soft pretzel. However, Apparently, we eat them differently than you eat them here. Is anybody here from Germany? Oh, oh, right. Uh, excuse me. Uh, what do you put on a pretzel before you eat it? What? No, you put good old yellow mustard on a pretzel. That's the American way. And that's why my country is as fucked up as it is. <laughs> Dude, why is America so fucked that they got mustard all over their pretzels? It gets into their system. Look what they did to their president's hair that one time. <laughs> Sorry, I promised I wouldn't go there. But, boy, how did I get on pretzels from a job that I was taking? I, I am getting old. What? Philadelphia, that's why. I was looking for a new job, and I went to a place that had uh, answered my inquiry. Hi, I make science. Can I come make some boxes of science for you? And I thought this place would work. Karma had brought me to this place. It was called Bear's Den Bio. Bear's Den. It's furry. It's got to be a good place to work. So when I went there, I, I saw their logo. Their logo was a triangle with a bear standing on the lower end of the triangle, peering into the abyss. OK. And when I went inside for my first day of work, having accepted their somewhat generous offer. I asked somebody, that, that logo is, is interesting. What's, what does it mean? And he looked at me just like Cheetah Light did at Frankfurt. And he said, yeah, that's a bear going downhill. <laughs> oh, okay. 
We had a very, very nice laboratory facility. It was located in an, uh, in an office park that was in a valley. And my understanding was that they paid a very, very low rent here. They'd gotten an exquisite deal. Apparently, the owner of the company, whom I shall refer to simply as Mary, Mary had gotten a very, very good deal on this office space which had been converted to laboratory space. And I was given the tour of the facility and I was shown the bathrooms. And I was told very, very, very clearly and earnestly, and these are the bathrooms, don't let the toilet run. Meaning that when it finishes flushing, it should shut off. Don't let it keep going. I said, okay, that doesn't seem so difficult. And the guy looked at me and said, <laughs> that's very strange. That's very strange. What, what could he possibly mean by that? What indeed? Let me tell you a story. One day, Mary went in there to uh, attend to some matters of business. And apparently, she was not careful to see to it that the toilet had finished its proper flushing cycle. My office faced the hallway where the restrooms were located. Now, a wonderful movie came out in the 1990s, and Mr. Cameron gave us a movie called Titanic. <laughs> Do you remember that scene, the hallway, with the water creeping up the hallway, closer and closer to the camera? That's what I was seeing. And it was coming very close, very fast. And in the next 18 seconds, I learned why the rent was so inexpensive on this office space. Because it was, hydrologically, the lowest point in the entire system should you allow the toilet to continue its flushing cycle it sets up a siphon effect and begins to suck all of the city's sewage out of it. From a scientific standpoint, this is fascinating. <laughs> But I did not have time to be fascinated. I jumped up out of my chair and I'm standing at, at the this approaching flood and a guy ran up next to me and said, oh God, she didn't. I said, what do we do? He said, somebody has to go in there and turn the, the water source off. I said, somebody who? He said, you're the new guy. <laughs> I said, okay, tell my mother I love her. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Anybody want to know what Mary had for lunch? You know, to this day, to this day, I cannot eat Chinese hot and sour soup. I can't. When I got there, it's like... I turned off the flood, heroically turned off the flood. And I came back and I'm, I'm looking at my shoes, my nice leather dress shoes. What am I going to wear home? Then I remembered, I, I'm Mr. Preparedness, I'm Mr. Emergency Management Man. In the trunk of my car, I have a disaster readiness kit. I can go get a pair of boots to wear home. The pair of boots which I could have gone and put on to begin with, now that I think about it. <laughs> I thought, 
That would be the only story I would ever tell about a flood. Until two weeks ago. <laughs> I like getting stories, but I don't like the getting of stories. There was some construction work being done at my current place of work. Uh, they were building out some laboratory space and of course lots of noises and sawing and hammering. It was very, very loud. And at one point, past my office, I saw one of the construction workers run at high speed. This can't be good. Maybe they're giving away free pretzels in the cafeteria. I went out and I looked in the hallway. Do you remember those terrible, terrible, tragic videos from the tsunami that struck Japan 10 years ago? That horrifying, satanic, black wall of water overtaking the land? That's what I saw. Creeping from beneath the door of the laboratory like the blob itself was this black liquid mass rapidly spreading out to engulf the hallway. And I first thought, do I still have those boots? Oh no, they're at home. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and I opened the door of the lab and I was met by a construction worker who was saturated from the top of his head to his ankles. Wild-eyed and terrified, he said, they told me it was disconnected. I didn't know it was still under pressure. And I said, what? And he held out his hand in which he held the head of a fire sprinkler. <laughs> and behind him, was a 12 centimeter wide pillar of water <laughs> erupting from the ceiling absolutely as black as the ace of spades that water in those pipes has been there since the building was built which in this case was 1972. <laughs> it's not clean natural poland ice spring water it was pouring out of there like the mouth of hell itself was vomiting forth some Pittsburgh de Butchtermina now that I think about it. <laughs> That's called a callback. It didn't work so good. I'm sorry. And it was just getting deeper and deeper around me. Now, fortunately, I am not only a trained emergency responder, I'm a trained scientist. The first thing I did was I ran and got the spill kit because when something spills, you have to contain it. So I'm getting these big, long, they, they look like vice force. They're these giant, long vice forces, and we're throwing them down, and we're constructing a dam to try to contain all this water. And the next thing that I realized was, I am in this laboratory, I am up to my ankles in water, and I saw all of the blinking lights, all of that equipment was still energized. All of that high voltage instrumentation was still under current. So I just started going and grabbing any cord I could find, any breaker I could find, yanking it out of the wall, slapping everything off so that nobody got electrocuted. I unplugged everything. I found out a week later, one of them had a plug that was under the table that wasn't on one of the circuit breakers. So apparently, I was standing ankle deep in water that was rising around this instrument that ran on 440 volts of high, high current. Who says science isn't exciting? <laughs> this is 
exactly the same shoes, by the way. You notice how they look? I didn't have to polish them. That's from the flood. I'll just keep it that way. You might not want to be around when I take them off, though. That's called Flood Mark II on my list up here. <sighs> Incidentally, we are now emerging from the nightmare that the whole COVID-19 pandemic caused to the world. I am sad to say that the disease is never going to go away. Please do not think it will go away. It's not going to. It is now here to stay. It's the new flu. Every year, you're gonna get the flu, you're gonna get COVID. That's the reality from now on. Fortunately, we did take precautions, most of us did, <laughs> and we were able to minimize the human impact. One thing that the business world found was that they can effectively operate meetings over the internet when people are at home. It can work. So some businesses have retained that model, and that's good. I would like to offer some sage words of advice from an older man to all you young folk out there. Yes, you are far more technologically savvy, perhaps, but there's some things you probably aren't thinking about. And that's what I'm here to tell you. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk today. <laughs> First off, if you have a smart TV, one of those ones that has the remote that you can talk into to bring things up, keep that remote on the table when you are having the meeting with your colleagues. Fortunately, I keep the camera turned off. The excuse that I give is that I'm not wearing a tie. I refuse to be seen in a business environment without a necktie. And people accept that. I had one, one company executive say to me, why do you wear a tie all the time? You don't have to, and I said, my religion requires it. Oh, he shut up real fast. <laughs> you can game the system in America, it's wonderful. So, I was on a meeting with some high-level scientists and some executives. I had the remote to my smart TV, which doubles as my work monitor. I didn't put it on the table in front of me. I think I tossed it down on the sofa when I went to get some coffee when some blowhard was talking about budget or money or future. Or what. Scientists don't give a damn about that. Call me back when you've got data, okay? So I went in the kitchen, got some coffee, you know, opened my laptop, looked at Fur Affinity, downloaded some porn, looked back at the video. Oh, okay. All right, we're, we're coming. Oh, oh, oh. oh. They're mentioning my name. Always listen for your name. Okay, uh, unmute. And I sat back on the sofa, not realizing that that remote apparently was behind my back. And it seemed I perhaps might have been depressing a button or two. Because, all right, uh, Dr. Conway, do you have a blah de blah de blah blah? Yes, yes, uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to uh, in, keep everybody up to speed on what's happening in our group. Our group is the Developmental Support Studies Group. Developmental Support Studies, abbreviated DSS. And as soon as I said I would like to give a report, on activities from DSS. My television said very loudly, playing Dirty Sexy Saint. <laughs> and the first thought was, maybe I forgot to unmute it. No. 
So I said, Randy, would you turn that down, please? I'm in a work meeting. Comics know how to think fast. <laughs> so be very careful with that remote. Also, if you are presenting and you want to show a video that you found on YouTube, download the video and put it into a PowerPoint. Don't switch to YouTube. Because those suggested videos over there, <laughs> I think you know what I mean. Because this nice video came up, but I wasn't looking at the video. I was like, oh, okay. Maybe nobody else. Uh... I am a gentleman. So I cut in and I said, uh, excuse me, uh, Amanda, could you full screen this, please? She said, oh, yes. So I went to full screen. And I hope I was the only one who saw it. Um, because when it was finished, I, I contacted Amanda on Microsoft Teams and I said, Amanda, please come to my next TED Talk. Download the video from YouTube. Do not show it from YouTube. And she said, why did the video not work? I said, oh, no, the video worked. The video worked, but now everybody knows how much you like those shirtless Korean boys. <laughs> but don't we all? <laughs> some stories that I tell about folks who are no longer with us and you may not know the names and that makes me sad maybe that's why I like to tell the stories years ago there was a figure in the fandom a controversial figure but let us not pay attention to the controversy let us pay attention to the joy and comedy that he brought to the fandom a very, very large, extremely talented and happy African-American gentleman named Jibba. Some of you know or remember Jibba from years past. He was a very, very talented comedian. Years and years and centuries and decades and minutes ago, when Euro Furrance was uh, in, in Turingen, in Seoul, if you have not seen pictures of Seoul, that mountaintop hotel, the Ringberg Hotel, it was magnificent. At the foot of the mountain was a little tiny restaurant called The Crazy Horse. It was an American-themed restaurant. And I thought it was so cute because they had pictures of John Wayne and, and like westerns and lariats and things like that. They had, they had some imagery that Jibba found very entertaining. We'll just leave it at that, okay? <clears throat> but one year, I think it was the last year we were there, uh, the staff decided that they were going to have a dinner, a staff dinner, at the Crazy Horse afterward. Please, please. If you should hear that the staff are going somewhere for dinner after the convention, please leave them the fuck alone. Don't go to that restaurant like 85 other people did to that little tiny restaurant that had seating for perhaps 15? 85 people descended on it. It was like, it was, it was, it was like, it was like some crowded thing. Help me out here. What was it like? Uh, uh, it sucked. My God, did it suck. It was, it, okay, this little tiny, the restaurant could not have been larger than this stage. And imagine the first eight rows trying to get in there to have dinner. It did not 
bode well. The staff, it's a family restaurant. It was mom, dad, the daughter, and I think the daughter's boyfriend was the cook. Four people from the family ran the Crazy Horse restaurant, and this army of furries showed up. They started to sit down. They were putting in orders. They were asking for things. Jibba and I thought it was funny because it was chaos, disorganized chaos. It was hilarious until, until the young lady, the daughter, who was the waitress, started to cry. Jibba was a lot of things, but he was a gentleman, as am I. We are not going to stand for that. So we jumped up and we started taking orders. We started clearing tables. We started doing whatever we could to make this work. I went behind the bar. They had this, this really cool sink. It had like two brushes standing upright. It was full of soapy water. And I was standing there and I said, this, this, this looks like a kind of washer. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, I, I could probably do this. The boss, dad, Patel, he saw me and he, he had a rag, he was right behind me. Threw the rag down and he came at me like this. I said, oh, 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 shit, 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 shit. I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, sorry. He said, not like that, like this, like this. Oh, yes, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, like this. I spent the night washing the goddamn dishes at the bar. People became impatient and started to leave. The orders that had been delayed as much as 45 minutes finally came out from the kitchen and the people who had ordered them had gotten tired of waiting and had left. So Jibba and I went to mom, the head waitress lady, and we say, all of the meals that have been abandoned, bring them here. My friend and I will eat them. And I'll pay for them. And she said, you can't do that. I said, honey, we're American. Watch us. <laughs> actually went through probably about 19 meals because that's like the supersized meal at Arby's back home and I said I said to dad I said bring me the bill here put on this card I'll pay for them all why did I do that because this hard-working family had just had their first experience with a major furry event I wanted them to be able to look back on it fondly and think, oh, how much money we made, even though it was difficult, rather than we completely lost our shirts because of those furries. Someday, I'm going to be dead and dust, but I want you guys to do that for the fandom and carry on when I'm gone. Please promise me you'll do that. minutes what I'd like to do is I'd like to give about a five minute break between this and the charity show to give you guys a chance to go to uh, to to de piss Zimmer um, and to give Fox a chance to rest his fingers so a very very quick little story I have down here there are times when being a performer on stage can help you in your everyday life there is an American furry personality, something of a newcomer, but an absolutely capital fellow. You might have heard the name Boozy Badger. Boozy is what we call a good old boy. He comes from the state of Kentucky. And he was going to come visit me. 
and I wanted to buy him some good Kentucky bourbon. But I don't know anything about bourbon. I'm a wine drinker and a sake drinker. So how was I going to get a good bourbon from my friend? I didn't want to ask him. That would spoil the surprise. Oh, Boozy, you, you happen to be coming to visit me. I'm completely and, and without any reason asking you what your favorite bourbon is. No, that's not going to work. So I, I went to the store where they sell liquor. And I was looking at this wall of bourbon. And there's some on the top, there's some on the bottom, there's some in the middle. This is expensive, that's expensive too. What do I do there for you carrying bottles? I kicked the crate over and I stood on top and I said, Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. Is there anyone here from the state of Kentucky? And the entire store went quiet. One man. <laughs> I said, what's the best bourbon? And he said, let me show you, boy. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> about you, Father. I could do this all day. Performing on this stage with, with, with your, your musical accompaniment is, is the absolute joy and highlight of my life, especially when it's the Eurofern stage. This is the greatest moment of my year. Year.